Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. On today's episode, I am joined by Matthew Casenzo, a chef, hunter, and writer. We discuss everything wild game meat, from the meat care in the field to aging meat, processing your own meat, what parts of the animal are used for, and Matthew's favorite dishes to cook. We dive into deep into wild game meat care, field to fork. Today's episode is brought to you by the Onyx Hunt app, which is your premier GPS hunting app that turns your phone into a working GPS. Onyx was founded on the land ownership detail on the map, and I find myself using that quite a bit to find overlooked hunting spots. Whether it's in the east or the west, you can find some overlooked pieces of public by getting behind the private which probably has a good f- food source too. If you want to check out the Onyx Hunt app for yourself, head over to onyxmaps.com and use the coupon code EMW to save 20%. Tethered is a company founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting. They now have the new Phantom XL saddle out for some of you Bigger guys and girls at that just, uh, you know, the regular Phantom or some of the other setups didn't cut it. This has a wide range that you're able to fit into. So now they're able to cover everyone from the smallest of people to the biggest and Tethered has you covered. So if you want to head over to tetherednation.com, you can learn more about saddle hunting and check out some of their great products. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. Their products are back with a lifetime no-fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. I'm using the B3 8x30 binos on all my eastern hunts. The small lightweight package makes it so easy to keep around your neck for shed hunting, turkey hunting, scouting, and hunting out of my saddle. You can use the coupon code East Meets West as gift for a free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. You can also check out the YouTube video I did reviewing the B3s and kind of see how I'm using them and get an idea of the, the package there. So that's over on my YouTube channel. Hunters require an accurate forecast of the best hunting days to save time on scouting and executing the hunts. The Spartan Forge Outfitter utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, including GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic and state research. They're using science rather than someone's opinion to figure out the movement for your specific hunting area. You can use the code East Meets West to save 25% off of the outfitter at SpartanForge.ai. And I've been announcing about Spartan Forge here for a while about this app that's coming out. And it is still true that there's going to be a price increase once this app comes out. So if you get in now, you're locked in. Uh, there's been a, a few issues as they've been developing the app, and they just want to make sure that it's perfect before it launches. So some extra testing has been required to to get some of the little bugs worked out. And Bill had put out a message on it, um, put it out on social media. Um, Bill is a founder of Spartan Forge, and I can promise you he does not settle for anything less than perfect. So. There's a reason why it's taking a little bit, but I promise you that it will be worth it. So check that out, SpartanForge.ai. Use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST to save 25%. And this week and for the next probably month, I will not have any Mountain Buck Monday posts or stories. Uh, Take a little break as we're going into me heading out on my Western hunts here and just kind of getting prepped and we'll be resuming that once uh probably late september so be bringing that back in and doing it i wasn't going to be able to keep up to the with the post while i'm out of service for a couple of weeks so i'm just gonna you know put a little bit of a pause on the, the mountain buck monday stories so i hope that uh that you enjoy this podcast with matthew and by the way, I did release uh, some new hats over um, 
I got some new hats. I, I don't have the, the name for them yet, but they'll be up on the, the website by the time this goes out. But a new Richardson hat, so Richardson 112 style. It's the Loden Green front with a camo mesh trucker on the back with the Compass logo on the front. Might be my favorite hat to date. I had debuted it a couple weeks ago at the, the, the Bucks and Bows event, and it went... It sold really well, but I still got some some in stock here and uh, going to be ready to ship. And just so you know, once, and I guess it would be by the end of this week, if you don't have any orders in, then it's going to, it's going to take me probably a couple weeks to get orders out because I'm a one-man show. I send all the orders out myself and I'll be hunting in Colorado so I won't have a way of shipping them. So please be patient during that couple week window. And um, anyways, I really appreciate you listening and I think you'll enjoy this podcast. It's timely for this time of year uh, with Matthew Casenzo. All right, we're live. Matt Casenzo, how's it going, man? I'm doing well. How are you doing, brother? Good, good. It was. Uh, it's good to finally get to talk to you a little bit. We've messaged back and forth the last few years on Instagram, but uh, it's good to talk to you. Yeah, I'm glad we got to do this and uh, go through a little bit of talk about cooking, a little bit of hunting, and uh, you weren't too far from where I lived. I was back in Jersey, and you were in PA, so yeah, I knew the neck of the woods. And you just you you're living the dream, and you just moved out west. I did. Yeah. I just uh, finally pulled the trigger about three months ago, got myself out to uh, Boise, Idaho. So uh, in a free state now, <laughs> get to have all the things I didn't get to have back East. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jersey's an interesting state. <laughs> it's a great state, but we have, and we have some incredible hunting, uh, huge black bears and really good bucks. Um, but comes down to it. You got to find the property to hunt. So a lot of small pieces and I mean, where I hunted back, uh, where I lived, some of the properties I hunted were two acres. Uh, so different dynamic. And when you got 160 inch deer walking through people's backyards, it's, uh, it's a different world. Yeah. Were you like in the suburbs or something where you lived at? I was, in far- I was in farm country. I was an hour outside of Manhattan, uh, but it was, uh, very rural, but with pocketed developments and, uh, a lot of big deer to say the least. I mean, I could tell you. People tell me I'm lying, but I've seen 180-inch deer walk through people's backyards. Really? Yeah. It's Last year, I shot – my my biggest buck last year I shot, his back tines were 14 inches, and I saw a buck that his inside spread was 24 inches. I have pictures to prove it. Ah, That's crazy. Yeah, you don't think about that when it comes to Jersey. But even like I know down around – when I lived down by Pittsburgh in the suburbs there, there would be guys that would come into the bow shop I worked at. There's this guy who came in, shot this buck in his backyard with a crossbow that – I can't remember the actual score, but it was just around 200. And it was just like – I held it in my hands and I was like, this is incredible. This looks like an Iowa deer. And, uh, yeah, sometimes those, 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 uh, suburban type areas or just small pockets there that don't get pressure. I I don't know what it is, but it's pretty crazy. I think it really comes, it's the small pockets and you have, you know, they, they don't care about people. So you get these little pockets of of woods and these deer concentrate in it. And it does change though. I will say like, one piece of property I was hunting last year, uh, the dynamic from early season to late season, because you lose so many, obviously the cover just changes. Yep. It just completely changes the pattern of the deer. So early season, I have, I killed my, my first doe of the year. I was in the in stand for 15 minutes. So literally sat down, didn't even have time to get set up and killed my first deer in 15 minutes. <laughs> and, we have, and we have unlimited does in, in that part of the state. So you could stack as many as you want. So it's, uh, Interesting. you get, you know, it's, it's nice to fill the freezer one and then two, it, you know, gets to shake the rust off too and test different broadheads over the years. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> Are you looking forward to trying some of the Western hunting out? I am. I'm uh, going to probably do some long range stuff and building a, a Canyon rifle right now. So, uh, that'll be come October and then, uh, maybe some elk hunting here in September. Uh, I have some, I worked in the fly fishing industry for almost 10 years. So I have some colleagues that are coming out and uh, we want to do some, you know, field the table cooking. So I may be doing some elk archery hunt early season, not too far from where I'm at now. So uh, fingers crossed that comes together, but I'm also starting a new business. So that's going to change 
that's gonna be fluid with what's going on on that side. Yeah, I was gonna say that's gonna be kind of a time suck a little bit there as you're getting that going. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. So. Yeah. So give me a little bit of a background on yourself. You know what? Um, you know, one how you kind of got into hunting, what you do for a living, and just and then also the the whole cooking side and how you got into that. So um, background on hunting. Uh, I grew up in a family that didn't hunt. Um, so I kind of started up with a family friend and family friends through my dad's business. My father was in heavy construction, uh, ran a major construction company through New York, New Jersey that specialized mostly in funnel construction. And so throughout the, throughout the years, I met, uh, a lot of different individuals and a gentleman by the name of uh, Frank, he was the first person to take me hunting. So I started hunting when I was 10, started shooting archery when I was about eight years old and, uh, progressed through, I didn't kill my first year till I was 17 uh because i only hunted once a year because that was just the time slot i had and then i started working in a fly shop a fly fishing pro shop when i was 13 so i taught fly tying lessons um saltwater flies you know casting lessons across the board spent almost 10 years in the shop so at that point going to college i always cooked and uh went to culinary school at that point after doing a year in community college trying to figure out what i wanted to do i went to culinary institute of america did my full bachelor's up there. And, uh, through that, you know, lived in California, worked at Pebble beach, worked throughout New York and New Jersey. And then as I was graduating, I always cooked and did field the table cooking. I reached out to, um, outdoor life network and I uh, filmed with Bill Gorman and, uh, it was uh, Tim Ray Jeff for uh, guide to the outdoors. We did a goose hunt. So that's what got me into really the, the writing aspect after after culinary school uh, was that video project we went down and shot snow geese while well, we attempted to shoot snow geese <laughs> in delaware and uh turned out you know the, the hunt didn't go well it was super warm and you planned for a recipe I, I wanted to pluck these birds roll them tie them do this whole thing where i i uh, butterfly them out the, the there was no fat on these birds because it was a late season so i had to completely change the recipe and i made 26 goose goose breasts for six guys I had three left by the end of it. So that was kind of my step into cooking for the outdoor industry. And then um, I walked into a Borders. Uh, there was a magazine called Cooking Wild. Uh, Andy and April Donald were the starters of that publication based out of California. And at the time, you had um, Hank Shaw, uh, Steve Ranella writing for them. Basically, everybody, uh, everybody that's big now was, started, was writing for that publication. And they did an incredible job with the layout and, and also the paper quality, just very similar to like what recoil has now. So wrote for them. Then it turned into meeting people and wrote for the NRA, did a couple pieces for American hunter. I'm then transitioned to writing for some bear hunting magazines. And now I write for recoil and, and recoil off grip. So, uh, doing mostly field the table cooking, but also getting involved into the bullet development side of things. And, you know, whatever really kind of fits what I'm looking to chase and I go do it. Awesome. That's, that's pretty cool. And then, yeah, you definitely have a quite a bit of a background in that. And I, I didn't know all of the, your background until we were talking a little bit beforehand here, but that's, that's pretty cool. And so do you, um, as far as what you do for a living is, are you doing any, are you a chef or do you, what, what else are you doing? I know you so right now, um, I cut my teeth in heavy construction after culinary school. Obviously everybody dealt with the econ the economic crash and I got out of the restaurant scene, uh, went back to school at 28, uh, for an engineering degree, which I need like one class to finish, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> and then right now I'm in the process of starting a new company in the Western United States uh, based specifically on infrastructure. Awesome. So uh, I have a, a a group of investors, uh, a team of people I've worked with in the past, uh, including my father. So uh, to get to start this up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So and then uh, you get to do all this kind of on the side is fun now. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it gives me a lot of flexibility, and uh, I get to pick the projects I want to work on. And like we spoke off camera, you know, I got a couple things up and coming with. Uh, some publications that you'll see, uh, in the coming months. So I'm pretty excited about. Oh, that's really cool. 
with it with what um i mean i obviously you loved hunting and you kind of got into that and everything so it probably was natural for you to get into the whole wild game cooking side of it and and everything and when we were talking about this idea i was like you know that's that's a uh, really cool idea i guess for the podcast some of the things you were talking to me about was just i mean we work so hard to to kill an animal and the next, you know, the next part is the, the whole, you know, one of the main reasons that you're there for is getting the meat and going through that entire process. And I think a good place to start is kind of meat care in the field, unless you think uh, of a different route there. Well, I gotta, I gotta tell you how I got into doing the cooking, the wild game cooking. Um, cause I think it, it, it stems into this. Yeah. And I was, um, my godfather was somebody who we used to go up. He was the type of guy who shoot his rifle once a year, go up to the deer camp up in New York and they'd kill the, you know, kill a deer. And that was it. Like they go through the butchering process. And I remember the one gentleman was cooking, uh, the tenderloins and being somebody who went to culinary school, you, you have to step back and watch and dry shake onions and dry sh- and all it. And watching them basically just destroy this prime piece of meat for lack of a better term. <laughs> And, and at that point, it was like, all right, guys, can I cook dinner tonight? So I did like a simple roast with whatever I found in the cupboard and everything else. And when I came back, which which stemmed me into cooking for that TV program, which never aired, was there was a, a, a gap um, with a technique-based approach, which is how culinary school is taught. It's not about a recipe. It's about approaching it with you know, the specific technique of a saute, braise, grill, uh, you know, br- you know, I, whatever it is, if it's sous vide, um, that's how it should be approached with anything. So when we get back into meat care, to me, every situation is going to be different. So my situation back where I grew up, I had the deer on the ground in the back of the truck and hung up in 15 minutes. Not everybody has that luxury. Yep. So, it, so it's really, it, in my opinion, it's, Get it dry, get it cool, and get the blood off the meat. And I think that's um, the three most important things. You know, um, for for how I don't want to jump ahead, but aging is a huge part of quality meat. Of quality meat. If you're not aging an animal, you're missing the boat, in my opinion. Um, but to do that, not everybody has a walk-in cooler, and there's ways to do it without it, and we can get to that. But um, when you get, if you're taking an animal down the field, um, keeping the cavity as closed as possible, if you're dragging that animal is super important. So you're not getting debris inside the animal. So when I used to field dress my deer in the field, cause I'd be in a very marshy area, I'd make my incision from in front of the mammary glands to the base of the, the breastplate. And I'd work in that small 12 inch incision to do all my field dressing. And I would not cut the asshole out. I would actually stretch the lower intestine, cut that, and remove that when I got home because it kept everything super tight and protected. So when I got back, I didn't have any type of debris inside the animal with leaves, dirt, and everything else. Yeah. Um, so to me, that's a really simple way you can sit there and mitigate um, getting dirt on your meat if you're dragging your animal. Just keep that incision small. Everybody wants to split everything wide open. And it's great. Yeah, you want to cool that deer down, but you have a lot more working time than most people think. Elk are, in a, are a different world. I mean, obviously, you're dealing with different temps. They're bigger animals. They hold more heat. Whitetails, if, you're, if that animal is not spread open within an hour, you're okay. It's, nothing's going to happen, especially if it's, you know, 50 degrees outside. Mm-hmm. You have a lot more work. That animal is still, you know, 98 degrees. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time to drop. So I think you have to be mindful of don't rush the process unless you have bugs, especially early season. That's a different case. That's when I'm working a lot faster is early season. I'm trying to get that animal down cool. But the other thing is, and this is going to be controversial. I'm not a fan of putting animals on ice specifically. I do not want that meat to touch ice. And I like to get that. If I'm going to put that meat in a cooler, I'm going to sit there and keep that cooler open and I'm going to put it on plastic. Contractor plastic is your friend. Uh, And I think if you put contractor plastic down, then you're, then you're, uh, and your meat on top of that, it's creating a barrier between your meat and the ice. So you're cooling the meat, but not 
soaking that meat and waterlogging that meat because that's in, in turn creating a much poorer product. So especially with something like pigs down in Texas, guys just throw them right in the cooler. You're just waterlogging that meat. That's why coolers are such a great um, aspect where you can hang the whole deer and let the thing naturally come back down to temp. Not everybody has that option. You sure as hell don't have that option in the, in the you know in the backcountry, but you have that option with contractor plastic and and dry ice is another great thing. But and keeping if you ha- are going through the process with ice, keep the plugs open so everything drains. Gotcha. That's uh yeah, and 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 you can probably do that even more so now with like with the better coolers and stuff out there, you know, with Yetis and all the other different types of brands, whatever it is that that insulate a lot better. You, you know, you can have that plug open, and it's not you're not losing all. It's not you know all draining in a short amount of time. No, and so those so keeping keeping everything cool and cooling down slowly. So aging. Let's just let, let me step back say you're working like you're in pa so you're a little bit closer to home when you shoot a deer right so yep. you're getting things out in larger quarters if you're not close if you're not close home you're getting the whole deer out yep so um early season our hunts back back east started in september i i always had a fridge in my house that i used specifically for aging and everybody's gonna be like a fridge you put a whole deer in a fridge yes so what you do is sheet pans parchment paper and you take your front quarters off, you split your rear quarters, and you take your, if you have a big enough deer, you take the neck off and you leave the whole carcass. And what I'll do is I'll, and this is in a, in a you know, half freezer, half reg. I'll take two quarters on sheet pans, um, uncovered, two front quarters, and I'll take the whole carcass and put it in the bottom of the fridge, uncovered on two sheet pans. So that's why I keep that incision small. And I'll send you pictures. You can post it. Yeah. And by doing this, you allow that meat to cool in the fridge. And then once it comes down to temp, I wrap that meat in plastic wrap that's sitting on sheet trays. Now that meat also has time to drain. You got to check it every uh, in the next day because you don't want that meat sitting in pooled blood. The other thing you could do is not everybody has a rack for every sheet pan in their house, but parchment paper creates a good barrier between the sheet pan and that. But now you're able to create an environment where you dry age that meat. It's not a true dry age because you're not creating this hard pellicle on the outside. But whenever you have a walk-in cooler, the humidity level is between 85 and 95 percent. So by wrapping that meat, you're creating that humidity level and you're dry aging that process. So I'll age my deer in that fridge for seven to 10 days. And now I have a way to cool my deer down with that with getting it out of my garage or out of my barn into the fridge, allowing it to cool, then wrap five to seven hours later. And now everything's protected. You lose a lot less yield because you don't get that hard pellicle from when you hang outside in your, in your shed or wherever else. So how, how long until you take the hide off? Uh, I tend to take the hide off immediately. Immediately. Okay. Once I get it, once I get it hung, I strip the hide off. And then if it's super warm out, I'll go through that process where I break the rear hams, break the front quarters, take the neck off, and put the whole carcass in the fridge. Gotcha. Late season, I'll hang it in the garage. Yep. Uh, because you'll lose a little bit more yield because you get that harder pellicle. It is what it is. But this is also where keeping that incision short, uh, when you feel dress, you're exposing less meat, so you're losing less meat. Yep. That makes sense. And because I've heard of where people hang it with the hide on, say if it's cold out for a while. And, and I, I've just heard different methods. So that's why I was interested in that. And, and I've, t- I've typically, um, at least the way I, I was taught growing up with my dad and stuff, we would hang the meat in our shed when it was cold out and just leave it there for a week or so before going through the, the, the cutting process. Like you said, it would get that, that hard shell kind on the outside there, but makes sense what you're saying. If you're not ruining a bunch of meat by getting contaminants on it from dragging it out or whatever else you're doing. And, and I found like even out West, so like when you have to break them down right there and, and typically I'm not gutting them or even on white tails here, if it's far away from the truck, I'm just doing the gutless method, taking the quarters off, but I'm always laying down like a garbage bag or contractor bag to lay it on until I get it in game bags to keep that meat clean. Absolutely. And I, and I, and I've done both methods where I've hung deer with the hide on and with the hide off. Mm -hmm. And I found I got a better quality product with the hide off. 
because that meat is slowly, it's cooling down more rapidly. Mm -hmm. That's just my experience with it. And you create a better product that way. So when you, when you're saying you, do you want to cool it down, you know, relatively right away, what, what kind of temperature are you looking at? Say if you were, um, like say you were in a, the back country or like, a, or somewhere where I can't get that meat back to a cooler right away, you know, what, what types of temperatures are you looking at there to get that meat down to? So obviously shade is really important. Um, and having done a lot less backcountry hunting than probably you, mm -hmm. um, your temperatures are going to, you know, as well as I do, if you sit in the shade, your t the temps are probably 15 to 20 degrees cooler. Yep. So the method of either putting the meat in, in the shade, getting over to Creek in certain instances, submerging it in a Creek and contractor bags is a great way to do it. Um, if it's really warm out, that's when you got to work. That's when you got to get that meat down to cool. That's where I'm going to be more diligent to find a cooler spot, find some yep. snow, whatever it is. But if you're working in that, say it's uh, dropping down to 50, 50 degrees and below, in my opinion, you have much more working time than you typically would if it was 70 to 80 degrees. Yeah. So I think you're, uh, you know, especially because you're not dealing with the same bug activity and your, your working time is much greater. Yeah. Which so is I, nice out there. Cause like in the mountains, it'll, it might be 75 degrees during the day, but when it, the sun goes down, in, it's nighttime, you're looking at the thirties sometimes, you know, and that obviously helps out with that cooling process pretty quickly. And you know, the other thing, some people get really concerned about, um, if you're really, especially with larger game animals, if it's, you know, specifically elk, if you're concerned about the temperature, take the debone it, split it, open it up, get it flattened out and submerge it, get in a cool spot. You're going to allow more heat to sit there and open up. Yes. By opening that, that meat up, you're going to lose uh, a little bit of volume because you're exposing more meat to air, but that's minimal uh, as long as you keep it dry. And that's the other thing you got to, and I, especially if you're keeping meat in game bags for extended periods of time, it doesn't hurt to switch game bags and get a dry bag on that, especially if that meat's fresh and you got a lot of blood in that bag, switch out your game bags and you'll and onto a fresh one. I know a lot of guys do that in, uh, in Alaska where they rotate their bags huh. uh, to keep the quality of the product up. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I mean, too, like when you, when you debone them, um, too, that the problem can be is where you're probably you're packing the meat all together and not allowing airflow to hit there. We can probably keep the temperature up for longer. And I think probably people get meat in their packs too quick. You got, before you stack it in your pack, you got to let it come down in temperature. Take that time to let it cool. You don't want to just sit there and throw freshly hot meat that you just butchered right into a pack, lay it out. And somebody can steal this idea. I think if you had uh, game bags that were more, especially for back straps, so they're not stacked on top of one another, mm -hmm. and you had more on a long, a long tubular style game bag that that strap could sit there and sit and wouldn't sit on top of itself, it's going to cool better. You're going to create a better quality product. So you're not going to gray out meat that's stacked on top of one another. Now this is me being the you know yeah. the OCD chef that I am that I'm going to be like I just want to pull the best quality product that I possibly can out. Yeah. Uh, and, and so if you're not taking care of that, like right in the field and the aging process, right. Is that have anything to do with like what you would consider the gaminess taste to it? Yeah. It, it, especially if you have, um, meat that's soaked in that's soaking in its own blood, that will definitely come through on the flavor profile on the backside. So if you have, I'm going to say most people don't do this, but if I have gray meat when it's after it's aging, if it grays out on the surface, I trim all that off. I'd rather have that trimmed off, get me down to quality meat before I pack it. And the other thing that I do that um, I know some people have said this before, I've done it for years, is I don't over trim when I freeze. So all my back straps all have the silver skin on them when they go in the freezer. And I trim it after the fact because that's a protective layer when you freeze it, it's just, it's, it's better for the meat to trim after than before. So I trim all the fat, but silver skin doesn't go rancid. So I trim the silver skin after the fact. 
interesting. That's the opposite of what I've done. So that's uh, that's and an it interesting. saved you a lot of time. I was going to say, actually, that sounds it sounds a lot better from the processing side of it. <laughs> and it's easier to trim a semi-frozen piece of meat than it is a fresh piece of meat. So the colder the piece of meat, the easier it is to trim. Yeah, because they what I would always do with the back straps is I'd put it in the freezer for a short amount of time just to get it firm enough to be able to cut that. But if you're putting it in there wrapped up like that and taking it out, yeah, that's yeah, yeah a lot simpler. I always cut my back straps into about four inch sections. Uh, and I freeze them in two a pack or one a pack, depending on what you do. And I think that's the other thing. Too many people, uh, they, they cut everything down. They want everything wants into like perfect portions. Well, with that, that's great. But the aspect where you lose is you lose the ability to say, well, I want to do a whole roast out of, you know, my, you know, the top round, or I don't want just steaks. So by leaving the meat in whole portions, it allows a lot more flexibility to what you can cook. And what I also do personally is I freeze my shoulders whole I, because they're great to braise down for tacos and everything else. You braise the whole shoulder, like a 325 degree oven with everything, it'll pull apart like just like pulled pork. And uh, obviously shanks don't, you know, don't grind your shanks. Front shanks and back shanks, do not grind them. Save them for braise, for asabuco and everything else. So for me, like that's how I butcher my deer. I've always left large muscle groups because it allows me to work uh, with, gives me more, more options down the line for, throughout the year. And when you shoot, like last year, I think I shot seven deer. Um, that gives you a lot more versatility down the line if I want to make sausage or whatever. Yep. Yeah, instead of cutting it all up right away and then being like, oh, shit, I wish I could have done a you know a neck roast or I could have done like something else along those lines. And time-consuming-wise, if you're butchering a lot, it saves on your Yeah, hands. if you're shooting seven deer a year, yeah, you're definitely looking for some time-saving methods. <laughs> so, But the one thing you mentioned about um, uh, temperature and throughout the day, like fluctuations. Yep. So back east, like early season for us, we'll get days in November where it's 80 degrees out, right? We'll hit, have those really, really warm days. So um, you asked me about a, a vari- like a variable. If I'm having like I like my buck I shot this year in November, I had um, I had him hanging for two and a half days before I had to get him broken down and get him into the fridge because we had temperatures that were getting up towards the low 50s. And at that point, it was too warm. And then that during the day, I threw a contractor bag with a with a uh, twenty five pound bag of ice in his in, in his cavity to cool him down to hold him over into the evening to break him down. So you have to, mo- especially with us back east, with the monitoring of hanging deer, you have to be able to be flexible and say, I I can't let him hang fully. I got to get him in a fridge or in another aspect to, to cool an age. Yep. So, uh, and is there any difference like um so if you say you had like a, a fridge that was dedicated to putting meat in that if you had the shelves all removed hanging it like with meat hooks versus laying them on a tray would that help with like the blood control and everything um i've done it where i've hung it in the, in the fridge um if you have the space it's great the it can help with uh, with the blood aspect because you're not having anything sitting. Um, but for most people, they don't have a full fridge. So even if you have like a half freezer, half fridge, the trays make it a little bit easier on space. I would say that. Okay. But the other thing I would still, even though I'd ha- if you hang it from meat hooks inside the fridge, I would still wrap it in plastic wrap because you're creating um, that moist environment that's creating that that uh, better higher uh, losing the term <laughs> <laughs> humidity level in the fridge for that meat to properly age and you don't get that that hard pellicle gotcha. because that hard pellicle just adds to this next process of i gotta trim this off i'm losing this and then you know it, it just it's another step so to go back to something else that we, when we were talking about, like you get that gaminess uh, flavor to it, does that, or like the, with the different types of flavor, I guess, with the meat, would that have anything to do with the age of the deer or is that kind of a myth? 
every deal deer is an individual. So uh, I do believe that aging a deer um, obviously helps to mitigate that flavor profile that people quote unquote call gaminess. Yep. Um, but also your, how far you take it temperature wise will change internal temperature when you're cooking will change how that deer tastes. So, um, so I gave two, uh, two loin, two loin racks to my, uh, my, my buddy who's a chef back East from that big buck I shot to give you an idea that buck was 275 pounds on the hoof. Um, and the, the loins on that deer were over four inches. So when I cut them and I, and I, I did like tomahawk chops out of them and, uh, he cooked his medium rare and for his, for his, uh, his wife, he cooked them more towards well. And the flavor profile just totally changed and it got super intense, super pungent. And he wasn't like super, super stinky when I shot him, but you knew he was a ruddy, ruddy buck. Yeah. I mean, his neck was 10 pounds boned out. So he was just, he's a big boy. So I think it really comes down to you got to keep it in that temperature zone of cooking it to medium rare, especially when you have these older deer and that, and that aging process, like that deer I took to 12 to 13 days aging wise, it's only going to help. It doesn't hurt. And especially if you're not losing volume with, you know, hard pellicle and you got trim it all out, I say go with it. I mean, um, I think that applies to all deer species if it's elk moose um you know even cows i mean you know i I don't know if you've ever dove into people have been aging who have aged uh beef for like almost half a year just to see what it comes out to um and the funky thing you get with other flavor profiles is the fat so the fat is your is is your is something you have to be mindful of because that will go rancid Mm -hmm. but same thing in a in a freezer uh, fat will go rancid in a freezer. So there's another reason why when I grind my venison, I don't add fat. So I keep everything straight because it gives you more options down the line, but mm-hmm. it also can't turn in a freezer, especially pork fat or beef fat. What about so, the thickness like of your steak? Say like, um, when you're cutting them up, does that have anything to do, to do with it or no? I don't think that, I think it's really about internal temperature and it's about yeah. how you cook. it comes down to, so I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but, um, there is a push for everybody on to push pellet grills right now. And everybody wants the easy button of stick a probe thermometer in it and, you know, and get to an internal temperature and then reverse sear. So that's great, but you don't have it. There's no technique based with that. So you don't learn anything. So if you, for me personally, I like to keep my steaks thick because it gives you more of a cushion. So if I cut my back straps, they're typically in four inch sections. That's how I typically cut all my back straps. And depending on the size of the deer, obviously that's going to vary. Um, But that gives me an opportunity to not overcook the outside and the inside. Because everybody wants to, when especially in a dry cooking method, let's just take like saute, like you're going to throw it in a cast iron on, on a stove, sear on all sides, finish it in the oven. Everybody wants to turn the stove all the way up But the problem with that is with venison, because there's no fat internal, you'll see people where it'll gray out all the way out and then they'll have a pink inside. And what that is, is people are cooking it all too fast on one side and the other side. So they're not allowing that meat to come up to temperature. So the other thing you have to do, especially with steaks, is you have to let them come to room temperature. If you're not letting your meat come to room temperature, that also just accelerates the process because now you're cooking this piece of meat into a ripping hot pan and that meat's trying to come up to the temperature of the pan, but can't as quickly as because it's ice cold. So uh, to- that's, that's, I'm asking a lot of these questions from experience recently with my deer that I, um, my buck I shot this past year, just like, I felt like it just did not taste good, the steaks. And until I, I actually was, cu- I cut some a little bit thinner and maybe I would just did something different with the cooking and maybe the way I was, I I do not claim to be a chef by any means. I'm trying to learn to be better, but it, (laughs) I thought it tasted okay. My girlfriend said I didn't do a very good job and I was like, and, but you know, as you're saying these things, I can see a lot of mistakes. I didn't let it get down to room temperature. Um, so I might've been cooking it too hot, even on the the grill on the outside, not letting the whole thing kind of warm up. I, I don't know. It's just, it, um, 
it, it's been a process of kind of learning that speci- a deer seemed like it was tougher for me to cook than some of the other deer and then caribou and elk that I've cooked in the past. And, and I, and there's, to me, that's a learning experience and yep. too many people are afraid to make a bad meal. Yep. And I, you have to be willing to screw up and, and go through the process. So for me, cook on a, on a, a medium high temperature, but move the meat more, rotate the meat more. Get, you know, you, if you're going to sit there and worry about char, you can get that char after the fact by just basting with butter. Cause now you're going to create that my, what we call the Maillard reaction. It's the caramelization of proteins. That outside of the meat is going to caramelize, but you're bringing up slowly. The other thing is I don't ever take my venison over an internal temperature of 115. And then I let it rest. If I go in 115, that's, that's to me like the perfect mid-rare. And I, I see too many people post on Instagram. You'll, you'll see it. You'll see this great out ring of gray. And then the meat's just still pink in the center. And I'm like, you just killed that piece of venison. <laughs> and it hurts. Now, and I'm, like, now I'm going to be self-conscious before I post anything about the meat I cook up. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I've posted pictures and I've, I've seen it myself. Like I cooked the other night and I saw it where like I cooked a piece of uh, loin the other night and I let it rest in the pan a little too long. And I could see I had a gray area on the one side and it was perfect on the other. And I was like, shit, like I, I screwed that piece up. Now, did it still taste good? But I knew technique wise what I did mm-hmm. and be mindful of it. But the other thing is just let that, especially in bigger chunks of meat, let it come up to temp, let it come up to room temp, just like you would a proper steak, uh, you know, a thick ribeye or anything else. Let it come up to room temp 30 minutes before it's going to help that process cooking of cooking that piece of meat a lot easier because that inside, it's not getting shocked. We'll use that, that, that term, even though it's not right, but that meat's not getting shocked in the pan because you're slamming it with all this heat yeah. and then just, trying to come up internally so yeah um, i'm definitely self-reflecting on some mistakes there <laughs> no and, and, and that's okay i mean you have to i, I listen anybody who says they've never made a bad meal is full of shit yeah and i think that's part of it and i think that's that's the growth aspect that's how i got to the point with with like my aging process of how it worked for me um and i'll never and this is a great story so um my buddy, buddy Chez is a chef. He was a chef owner, of a couple of restaurants back East in Jersey. And, uh, I brought, I brought in a piece of backstrap. It was out of a smaller dough and I brought it into him to the restaurant. I said, Chez, make two raw preparations. And this was aged for seven days. I'm like, do a tartare, do a carpaccio. And at the time, uh, the manager came over, Chez put some stuff together, real simplistic, like gremolata, just incredible. The manager comes over who I went to school with. He tastes, he looks at me, he's like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> he's like, how do we replicate this? I said, you can't because it's a wild product. And I just replicated that with my aging process. You won't be able to in a restaurant scenario. So even a, like you want to shock people, do a raw preparation. Like take your buck that you do, do a carpaccio out of it. See if you see a change in flavor profile. And I guarantee you will, because it's all about the cooking technique. It's not about that animal. Too many people say, oh, that, that it's the same thing with wild pigs. You hear everybody talk about big boars. They taste like, they, they taste like garbage. Yeah. Them in, I shot a pig down in Texas that was, uh, it was, it was 198 pounds. I took him back to Jersey and we, we cooked him up and he was as good as any small pig I shot. And it was all about just the process and cooking. And I will say out of anything, that's the protein that's hard to cook. Wild boar is probably the most difficult protein I've ever had to work with because there is such a small window of working opportunity and you, especially dry cooking where you can, you just dry it out. So goddamn quick. Interesting. So, um, I, I say everybody's like venison's hard. Pigs are harder. <laughs> 100%. Ah, interesting. I, um, that, that's, that's cool. And it gives me, you know, cause like I said, I, I wasn't, I was never sure if it was more of a myth as far as like, Oh, this deer is just, this way or whatever but um yeah it sounds like you can kind of get past a little bit with the technique and everything else as far as cooking process i think there are, there's no question there's some deer that are going to be more pungent than others there's I, I mean that that goes without saying but when you start taking it beyond a certain temperature that's when it really shows up and when you start getting past that medium especially you're going to start really sensing it it's going to get Especially if you if you've ever taken a piece of venison and reheated a piece of venison, yeah, you know, really pungent, same concept. Um, to me, that's really a temperature thing. 
uh, and re so a lot of times when I cook venison, if I'm eating it the next day, I won't reheat it. I'll just eat it cold. So it, it just, you know, it's my preference. Yeah. You know, I, I do think it's a temperature thing. Every animal is an individual. So every animal is going to feel differently when you, uh, when you cook it. Thermometers are great. Feel method is better. Um, so if you've never, if you don't understand when you touch a steak and how it feels to what temperature you're getting at, that's really important. And this is the other thing that I talk about with why, why I kind of like talk down about pellet grills is because every, like we said, every animal is individual. Every animal will feel different as it cooks. I, I got three de different deer in the freezer right now that I can tell you point blank. Every time they cook, they feel different. So it's a slightly different feel. And how I do it is I make a fist. And if you touch your, your pointer and your thumb, the web in your hand, that, that right there is medium rare. Slightly open is rare. Make a fist, that's well done. And I've written, an, you can search me on, uh, on with NRA, and I did a whole thing about this with the feel method for one of the editorials. Some people use their cheek. I always use the web in my thumb and forefinger. So if you just touch your fingers lightly and feel, that's medium rare. This works for chicken. This works for fish. This works for everything. So it's simple little tricks like that. Yeah. Um, when I talk, when I talk about big cooking, like big pieces of meat, like roasts or anything like that, I'm a firm believer in an internal probe thermometer, where you're not pushing it in constantly to check the temp. Uh, meter makes one that's pretty cool. Uh, I don't get anything from that, but it's a really bitching little thing. You stick it in the meat, it links to your phone. It'll tell you your oven temperature and your internal temperature. And the key to that is bring it up to internal temp, leave your probe in until that meat fully rests. Don't rip it out. Let that meat come down to room, you know, back to that temperature, let the meat, the juices redistribute to the meat, then pull your probe. But any type of internal probe or that meter uh, that links to your phone is an awesome little thing for bigger, thicker cuts. Yeah. Like roast in the oven or on the grill or anything like that. So what's your resting method look like? Uh, uncovered and out in a cutting board. Uncovered. And on a cutting board. Um, I don't really believe in the whole – I think if you tent a piece of meat, you're steaming it. And you're losing that hard uh, – what you worked for, which is that crust. Um there's, there's aspects with barbecue that that makes sense. Like if you're doing brisket or pulled pork off a smoker or something like that. But when it comes down to steaks or a roast out of the oven, cutting board, let it naturally come to temp. If it's a really big piece of meat and you want to gently tent it because you're waiting for, you don't want it to cool down too quick. That's a different story, but smaller pieces of meat, cutting board, 10, 10 minutes, maybe depending on the thickness. Ah, uh -huh. that's, that's another interesting thing that, that I'm learning here. I always covered it and that's just what I thought you were supposed to do when you were resting it. I, I, um, I'm going to try that. I prefer to leave it uncovered because I feel if you cover it, you're steaming it. Mm -hmm. And now you're increasing your, that, that piece of meat's going to increase in temperature anywhere between 12 and 15 degrees. So to me, that's where like you have that. That's why I say I always pull it at 115. You pull it at 115, you're going to get a perfect medium rare. And I prefer things that are more rare than, than mid rare. Um, it gives you a little bit better internal texture and everything else. But the minute you cover it, you're holding all that heat in, that means just continue to cook. And you're probably going to jack that up over, over 20 degrees. So that's my take. Everybody's got their own method. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, I like it. I, I'm, I'm glad you gave your opinion on that because I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm going to try it. I mean, it doesn't hurt to give it a shot. It, it, barbecue is different. Like it, there's a different, like, you know, like everybody's talking about, you know, the pellet grills. Um, that's great. But if we're just dry cooking, especially something with not a lot of fat internally, you're going to dry that piece of meat out. So, because you're going to continue that temperature to, to rise. Um it's the same reason like why we take chicken and we brine chicken in restaurants because we're trying to create more moisture in that piece of chicken or any type of protein yep. or we do it with fish. You, you're with wild game. you already have no fat. You don't want to take that temp over top. Um, it's why I don't add fat to my burgers. Um, I think to me, a properly cooked burger, you don't need it. Now, is it, it, and a lot of times I also do that for, for the ability to have more flexibility throughout the year. 
And um, little trick, and it's been seen before when you if you vacuum pack your uh, your your burger, yep. flat, make them in flat packages. And if they they stack in the freezer, one and two, and if you want to defrost them, stick them in a cold bowl a bowl of water. They'll defrost in about twenty minutes. So it's so it's a really quick like if you need a meal. <laughs> yeah. Night, I got to, I want just something quick. That's the other, another thing. But for me throughout the year, say you want to make sausage or you want to make anything out of that, I can add fat. You can never take it out. So that's why I, and I only do a single grind on my, my venison. Typically I do a single large grind. I said before, I don't grind shanks. Your shanks are like money. Those are braised items. Um, and also you don't want all that send you in your, and silver skin into your grind. So I think that's, it's better to leave that out and trim as much of that off as you can before you grind. Yeah. It's a little bitch bit to clean your grinder too. If you get all that in there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plastic wrap doesn't push that through. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and by the way, I just bought a pellet grill. So <laughs> I, I, listen, I think pellet grills are a great tool. Yeah. I really do. I think they're an incredible tool. Um, but I, I, it's like what we talked about before. Um, I want to create recipes for people and, and I don't post a lot of recipes on my Instagram. Hell, I barely post on my Instagram as that much because I've been so freaking busy the last couple months. But for me personally, I want to be able to, anybody can approach this and create it with whatever they have in the house. Um, and you can replicate, you can't replicate the smoke out of the pellet grill, but you can get the same quality product in a saute pan if you apply techniques. And it comes down to technique and it's, it's a learned thing. This is not where you're going to have it overnight. You're going to screw it up. Yep. And the other thing, like everybody wants to wrap everything in bacon. I've said it before. I'll say it again, bacon in moderation, because that's all you'll ever taste. I think it's great. It works in certain things, but especially in venison, I I just want to wrap it in bacon. Well, then just eat straight freaking bacon because that's all you're getting out of it. So I would rather cook with olive oil based with herbs and butter for a loin and then do a pan sauce out of it. And you're going to create a better quality product. You're going to truly taste what that meat is. Cause that's why we work our asses off. Yeah. To hunt, is to get that quality protein and to taste what we really hunted or hunted for. Cause you can't replicate that buying in a store. You can buy farm raised venison. It's not the same. I can tell you too many years of working and cooking. I've cooked plenty of farm raised venison. It, it's not the same. It doesn't react the same. It doesn't have the same flavor profile. It doesn't have the same texture either. So it's great as a substitute, but you'll never, uh, you'll never replicate it. Maybe this is a loaded question, but what, what would be your top three, like venison, I don't know, techniques or meals or how, what you would cook? Like what are some of your favorite, th- favorite let, things to cook? Let, let's take it a step further. Yeah. Uh, tell me, tell, tell me the scenario you want to create a recipe for. You mean as far as what cut of meat? No. Well, tell me what cut of meat and then tell me the application. Are you cooking for a group or are you cooking for like your girlfriend? Okay. Let's, Maybe. let's do, let's do one of, um, just for like, for my girlfriend and then we'll do one for a group. Okay. So for me, like, I think any type of dry cooking method is fantastic. So I always left, uh, on the, uh, like the, the top round and the bottom round. Not your ball roast. Your ball roast is probably my least favorite cut off of, off a rear, uh, rear ham, but a, a, like a top round is one of my favorites, especially on the grill. And that marinated, uh, like in a chimichurri on the grill is, is epic sliced up. That's great. You could do that. Super simple, great summertime recipe, uh, especially with like fresh grilled, gr- grilled vegetables or, um, any type of potato dish to me, that really funnels that way. Uh, cause it's, quick. You can do that in 15 to 20 minutes. It's super fast. It's efficient. You have great flavors, but you're not overpowering the meat because you are still maintaining that integrity where I'm not dousing it in the heavy sauce. Chimichurri has a great way where it complements. And if you do, if you look at like any of the gaucho cooking from Argentina, it's a fantastic way. Great glass of wine, simple. That's one of my favorite ways to eat a piece of venison in that application. Okay. Um, In a group method, I think either if you kept your whole, your shoulders whole or shanks and in a braise method, because it's basically set it and forget it. 
uh, in an oven and let it go for six hours, depending on, or you could do this with necks. Um, all three of those work, a neck, a shoulder, or shanks. Um, I'm gonna do a shameless plug, but I think it's one of my favorite recipes. So I do a, uh, a root beer guava braise um, and I did it with pork and you can find it on American Hunter. Bar none, I've used that recipe with lamb, venison, pork, you name it, I've probably cooked with it. And for tacos, it is epic. Um, it's a, my twist on cola, pra cola braised pork. And I love that combination. So I think for a group, uh, that's one of my favorite ways because the whole goal to be in a group is I don't want to be worrying about everything. So stick it in an oven, walk away. It's not going to burn. You do it in a heavy cast iron, like a, like a Lake Rousse. Like I am a firm believer in everybody needs an enamel coated cast iron in their kitchen. It's the greatest vessel you can possibly have. And it gives you a lot of versatility. Uh, but doing that, basically it pulls apart like pulled pork and you pull it off into, into the sauce. Flour tortillas, pickled onions, cilantro, cotilla, your money. Oh, I love it. I'm, I'm going to have to – you said that you have that recipe up on it's, American Hunter? It's on American Hunter. If you search my name, it's it's up there, and uh, I'll send you a link. And, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I love that recipe. I've done it with shanks. I've done it with neck. I've done it with, with whole sh venison shoulders, um, shank off bone in. And they just – it's it's simple – and you can, I, hell, I've done it, uh, done it with uh, with lamb, and it comes out great. So, I think any type of braise like that, any type of slow cooking method, um, especially when you have flavor profiles with chilies and the sweetness of the uh, the root beer and the sweetness of the guava, there's so many levels to it that it just accentuates the meat. But it doesn't. You still know you're eating venison, and that's for me is the most important thing. I still want to know I'm eating the protein I worked my ass off for. Yeah. Where I'm not, I'm not, it, it's accentuating it. It's not covering it. Yep. So it, what, um, what are some, is, is there any other things you see or anything like to, to kind of wrap this up as far as that you see people do that makes you cringe or like, or maybe something to help people that are cooking wild game, anything that we haven't talked about to this point that you think would be important? I think, be patient. I think uh, be willing to fail. Um, be willing to make a bad recipe um, because you that's what you learn from. Don't base everything off a recipe. So I came up in culinary school when Food Network was all the rage. So everything was recipe, recipe, recipe. My mother is a recipe queen. I love her to death, but it's one of those things. Be willing to stray from a recipe. Understand that you can substitute ingredients if you know the basic technique, if you know the basics of a saute, the basics of a grill, the basics of a braise, it's just substituting ingredients. Even my recipes, I say it all the time, like that, um, you know, you can take that root beer guava braise recipe and change out the root beer and substitute. You could do a, like uh, I've done over the years, I've done beer braise stuff with like with Guinness. Like there's recipes you can take and adapt recipes that we've had for lamb or any traditional cooking method and approach it, uh, apply it to wild game. I think the biggest mistake I see is everybody is looking for the easy button. Yeah. And, and there is no the, cooking is not about easy. It's about, it's about the experience. Of, it's about approaching a product and treating it with, with the same work you put in, in a field, you should put it into, into the plate. And to me, uh, it doesn't have to be complex. My food has never been complex. My food is always simple, in my, in my opinion. But um, it really depends on the person looking at that dish. So I say, go at it. Have fun with it. Don't be, be willing to fail. Uh, be willing yeah. to screw up the recipe. And... Don't be afraid to adapt a recipe you already have to, to, to using wild game in it. And if you have questions, shoot me a DM. I answer them. Um, I have, I mean, I don't post a ton with recipes cause I think it pigeonholes too many people, uh, when they cook recipes to me should be guidelines Yep. and building and, and, and you should have building blocks to get to that recipe. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think if there's one like main thing that I'm taking away from this is technique over the specific recipe or spice or whatever the technique to it. Yeah, I, I and like I said, I, I'm not knocking any of the the pellet grills or the spice blends. They're great. Don't get me wrong; they have a they have a place, but you don't need all that to create an incredible meal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get back the basics. Um, you know, that's like I said, the one thing everybody needs in their kitchen is enamel coated uh, cast iron. Cause that you have so you can make asabuco, you can make any type of stew, any type of braise. And I will say this though. I think you get, um, everybody likes crock pots. I'm anti crock pot. And I know people are going to hate me for that, but I think you get a better, especially at wild game specifically because you're dealing with a lower fat content meat. I find doing it in an oven in a lower temperature, you get a better quality product. Interesting. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah. Um, my experience. Uh, maybe I'm just biased. <laughs> yeah. I need to add one of those cast iron to my kitchen for sure. Yeah. It, it's I got a couple of them and they're not cheap, but they're worth it. The Lake Crusade are, in my opinion, the best in the market. They're okay. worth the investment. So uh, every, every chef, every person who hunts should have one in their kitchen. Love it. Cleanup is a lot easier than any cast iron, and uh, they don't react to tomato sauce or anything like that, where you're pulling seasoning out or of a t- typical cast iron. Interesting. Okay, well, Matt, where can people find uh, you? Said you do some stuff on social media, and then some of your writing. Give us give us some shameless so plugs here. Stuff uh, coming out in recoil in the next couple months. I'm going to be. I do some bullet stuff with recoil, and uh, also probably the best. Uh, outdoor magazine when it comes out of cooking is Recoil Carnivore. I'm going to give Ian Harrison a shameless plug because he killed it on that magazine. Uh, you could find me at Matthew Cazenzo on Instagram. Uh, I do have the same page on Facebook, but most of my stuff I'm going to post on Instagram. Uh, so follow me on there. Um, shoot me a DM. Have any questions? Now that I'm out in a free state, I will be posting more. I promise. I'll be cooking a little bit more. Um, <laughs> see some uh, some open fire cooking here shortly, so I'm going to be messing around with that uh, in the next uh, couple months. So some different products, and uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. And you'll see some new archery stuff I've been playing with, and I know you've been shooting the same bows I yeah, am. So yep. All same stuff. So yeah, I'm sure you and I will be bouncing ideas or things back and forth. We're we're shooting very similar set up same bows you know same broadheads and stuff a little bit different components but yeah we're shooting a lot of the same stuff so yep. yeah no it's gonna be uh it's gonna be a fun year i'm, I'm excited uh new company uh, new products new location happy to be in idaho and uh i you also see a lot of fishing stuff for me so you'll probably see some of that post as well so awesome Yep. Well, cool. I really enjoyed this conversation, Matt. I, I, uh, appreciate you reaching out to me here with this idea because I think it, uh, I think a lot of people will benefit from, it. I know I have personally selfishly, so <laughs> I'm sure others will too. And I, um, I don't, like, like I said, I don't post a ton on social media with it. I think it's really, there's certain, especially with something like this, that's so technical where it's hard to get it through in a, in a post. Yeah, uh, story. It's too much. Even just in the short podcast, I could talk for three hours about different techniques and everything else and how I'd approach breaking down every aspect of an animal or what books to go have on your, on your shelf. So there's so much to sit there and discuss. And I mean, you spend three and a half years in culinary school, you go through and how we're taught is it starts from the basics. Yep. It starts from how you cut a piece of vegetable to how you butcher meat to your, your mother sauces and anybody who wants to look up a a Scoffier, um, a Scoffier is like godfather of, you know, modern French cooking and the brigade system. And if you've seen Ratatouille, the movie, that movie was based off of his techniques and Thomas Keller. So highly recommend go do a deep dive. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm here. So shoot me a message and we'll have to do this again. We can definitely go a lot more technical. Yeah. So yeah, I I, uh, I apologize that probably some of my questions and my um, my thought processes are pretty um, low level when it comes to this stuff. So it's uh, I, I I'm sure that you know as I dive into it some more, I can get some better questions for you. <laughs> no, the questions, are, the questions are on point. I think we hit everything that we needed to hit on this. Yeah, 
uh, especially with the aging process. And I will shoot you those pictures so you can post them. Yeah, definitely. That's something that is, I've never seen anybody else do. Uh, and I've kind of kept it in like a little, you know, back room. That's my little technique, but it works really well. Yeah. So, um, especially for people don't have a walk-in core. We all wish we had a walk-in core that make life easy for everybody. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm stoked. We got to do this and sooner or later you have to come out here. We'll have to do some shooting and some hunting together. Heck yeah. I'd, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm jealous and love to. So thanks again, Matt. My pleasure, man. Have a good night. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.